Okay, hello everyone. It looks like I am live, so welcome. Um, and thank you for joining me for another uh, Advotech live stream. Uh, I am Dr. Danielle Snowflack and I am the Senior Director of Education at Advotech. And I'm at Advotech live stream. Uh, I am Dr. Danielle Snowflack and I am the Senior Director of Advotech. So happy to be able to bring this workshop to you. Um, I'm gonna get into things quickly. Today we're talking about um, HIV biology and the way we can test for it um, and a little bit of history. So thanks again for joining. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Edvotech, you've heard this already, but for those of you who are not, um, we are the biotechnology education company. Um, so we were founded over 30 years ago now by uh, Dr. Jack Churchian, a professor of biochemistry at Georgetown University. Um, Edvotech was born to translate exciting developments in the research lab to hands-on experiments that students can do in the classroom. Um, and that's how we were born. Um, and so we work with educators all over the world uh, to help demystify science and to foster the next generation of scientists through hands-on active learning, uh, especially in the laboratory. Um, but we also hope to make biotechnology accessible to all labs, in research labs, outreach, biohacker labs, and of course our uh, core uh, teachers and, and, and educators. Um, but before we get to the workshop, um, I just want to point out that we are running another contest. Um, so we're excited to have you here um, and we want to get this biotechnology in your hands. Um, so we are giving away an EdvoCycler Junior. Uh, the EdvoCycler Junior is like the premier personal PCR machine. It is a 16 place thermal cycler with active heating and cooling, no strings or tablets attached. Uh, so it's, you know, if you were to purchase one, it's $6.99, which is a fantastic price, but we are giving one away to you for free. Um, so if you're really looking to supercharge your lab, this is the piece of equipment that you need. Um, and Maria will put that link in the uh, chat box in case you want to enter. Um, we would love to have your entries, of course. Um, we want to give you free stuff. So the experiment we're running today is Edvotech Kit 271, simulation of HIV detection by ELISA. Um, and so this is an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA, which is a highly sensitive test that uses antibodies to detect molecules within a complex sample. And it's very specific. And so today we're talking about a test that uses antibodies to detect the presence of HIV antibodies uh, in a patient sample. And we can use that to diagnose infection. And I'll run this assay from start to finish over the course of the web workshop. And while the experiment is running, we'll talk about the virus, we'll use origami organelles, um, which are also models that your students can build themselves in, in the classroom or at home to complement the lesson. Um, we'll talk about the way clinicians test for the virus, a little bit of history, uh, and a little bit about the methods that are used to identify and trace the virus. This demonstration is being recorded and our slides will be available on our website. If you'd like to be notified when they're posted, please fill out the form. Uh, Maria has also put that link in the chat box. Um, and furthermore, we are also offering uh, Maria has also been, and furthermore, we are also offering professional development certificates to those teachers who are joining us live. Um, so the link will be for the form will be alive for one hour after the presentation. So please be sure to complete it by 4:30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So let's talk about HIV. So, um, or well, let's actually start with the. Uh, the ELISA. Um, did I switch slides around? I, who knows? We're improvising now. Um, and so the, the test we're talking about here is the ELISA assay. Let me just make sure I didn't go one slide too far, which is a, I did go one slide too far. Okay, we're not improvising. We're going back. And so HIV AIDS is a serious worldwide uh, public health challenge um, and, and have been since it was identified as a problem in the early 1980s. Uh, today, HIV still infects millions of people around the world. Um, in fact, over 37 million people today are living uh, with HIV. Um, now, in the United States, if you're watching from the United States, we are, you know, in other, you know, developed countries, you know, we are very fortunate because we have a well-developed public health system um, with tracking, tracement, tracking, tracing, treatment, uh, and education. And so all of these are important parts um, to, you know, really get your, the public to understand the virus. Um, but, you know, there, there are a lot of places worldwide 
where people don't have access to care, treatment, or education, and HIV patients are frequently unaware of their HIV status, and so this leads to further spread of the virus. Now, in order to interrupt spread of the disease, public health professionals identify and contact any individuals which may have been, who may have been exposed to HIV. So in addition to allowing researchers to study the distribution patterns of disease spread, it allows clinicians to provide treatment and counseling to exposed people, to notify infected people so that they do not spread the disease further, and of course, to stop the spread of the disease within a community. Um, and of course, while I'm talking, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, but uh, you know, so as I mentioned uh, before, we are using the ELISA, and the ELISA is a highly sensitive assay, and it's very versatile, and we can use it to detect the presence of antigens in samples. Um, since we can generate antibodies to lots of different molecules, the ELISA is a highly versatile test that has been adapted for many uses. Um, so for example, you may have a food allergy, um, so you need to be careful about the food that you're eating. Foods that contain common allergens can be tested by ELISA to indicate that they're safe to eat. And so, you know, I've listed a few of them on this, a few uses of the ELISA on this table, uh, on this slide. But the truth is, you may have already performed an ELISA at home. Um, you know, we're going to be discussing the ELISA as it's used in medical testing. It's commonly used for medical diagnostics as it easily identifies antigens in blood, saliva, urine, and other biological fluids. And so if you've ever taken a pregnancy test, you have performed an ELISA at home. Um, the test is looking for the hormone HCG in your blood, which is indicative of early pregnancy. So the ELISA um, can be both quantitative and qualitative. Um, and so what does this mean? So the qualitative ELISA is gonna give us a yes or no answer. A strong signal, a strong signal is positive and no signal is negative. So yes or no. Um, so, you know, one example of that quantitative ELISA that you're familiar with is that pregnancy test. Um, so this is an at-home ELISA that looks for that hormone HCG in urine, um, and that's an indicator of pregnancy. And so you can't just be a little bit pregnant. You either are or you aren't. And so that's a yes or no answer. Um, and so when taken at the right time, the pregnancy test will give you a yes or no answer. In the qualitative ELISA, um, we're, we're asking how much. So we're using this to give us a number, give us a value um, of, for the amount of antigen that we have in the sample. Um, and so, um, you know, let's talk about food allergens again. And so this is an area where we can use the, quanti the, qualita the quantitative um, ELISA to find out how much of something is in a sample. So the ELISA is often used to test for the presence of known allergens that can be introduced in food through manufacturing. And so here's a label from some certified gluten-free oats. Um, and you can see on the label that it is certified by ELISA to three parts per million, which means there's very little to trace amounts, if any, gluten present in this product. Um, and so that can give you confidence when you're purchasing a food item that you will not have a reaction to it when you eat it. And so what do we need to perform the ELISA? So I am going to switch over to my camera um, so that I can start to show you. Um, is there, hold on. Yes, yeah, so I can start to show you um, the reagents and what we're using here. Um, and so um, this is a pretty standard ELISA. Um, you should all be able to see my camera at this point. So what do we need to perform the ELISA? So luckily, this experiment is pretty easy to run. Everything you need is already included with the kit. You basically just add water, um, which is, you know, the best kind of experiment. Um, and so, um, you know, everything you need is with the kit. Um, I will be wearing gloves today, but I just want to emphasize that this experiment, while it is a real ELISA, it is a simulation. There are no HIV proteins um, or virus or samples um, in, the, um, in this um, scenario. Can you guys all hear me um, or see me? Um, you know, if you can, let me know in the chat box because um, it is looking like I am frozen. Um, so, but my analytics are telling me my stream is healthy. So I'm gonna keep talking. Um, just let me know um, in the chat box. So what do we need to perform the ELISA? So we're gonna start with our test samples. Um, so all of our samples for these kits are going to come in this format. Um, so um, so these are going to come in this format. 
Um, they come as LIFO samples and you're just gonna add water to, uh, not water, you're gonna add buffer to the samples and we supply the buffer um, and resuspend them and aliquot them for your students. Um, so you can hear me talk, great. Are the slides moving? Are, are you, can, am I moving at all or no? I'm good, fantastic. Um, I don't know why it's frozen on my screen. I'm gonna keep rolling, um, but let me know if you have any problems in that chat box. So for our test samples, um, you know, for many medical tests, these are gonna be blood or urine or saliva from the patient. Um, and so what I have in here um, are patient samples and our controls. Um, so our patient samples are the ones we're testing, right? So these are gonna come from people who potentially have exposure um, you know, to HIV through different means. Um, and so those are gonna be here. They're my P1, P2. Um, we don't know how they're gonna turn out, whether they're gonna be positive or negative. Um, you know, but uh, you know, there are test samples. And if you were paying attention a couple slides ago, you might know how they're going to turn out, but um, sh let's pretend you don't. Um, and then, so we are also gonna have our positive and our negative controls. Um, so the, I have these pre-aliquoted, you will pre you will pre aliquot these for your students before the lab. Um, and they'll all be able to either work in a group or individually to do the test. Um, our control samples are samples that we know how they should react. Um, so we know what a positive control will give a positive result and a negative control will give a negative result. If our control fails or if our assay does not give the correct result, it, it does represent a learning moment though, um, the negative result. If our control fails or if our assay does not give the correct result, it, it doesn't know. And so your students will have to analyze and explain what went wrong as carefully as what went right. And it's important to acknowledge that, you know, sometimes science is messy and even experiments that don't work can teach us important lessons. And you can also talk about what that, con what that means in the context of um, medical testing, what it would mean if you have an indeterminate result or if your controls fail. Um, so we also have our HIV antigens. They're going to be in here. Again, these are simulated. I have them labeled with AG for antigen. Um, so far, related, I have them labeled with AG and HIV. To do this, we coat the plate with HIV antigens and we look for our patient samples to interact. We have our enzyme-linked antibody. Um, this allows us to detect the presence of HIV proteins and antibodies in patient samples. It's connected to an enzyme that turns over a particular substrate, which we can visualize. Um, we have buffer, um, which comes as a concentrate. You dilute it when you, you come, or this buffer is, we have two kinds of buffer, one that you're gonna dilute um, your sample in, and then a second buffer that is our wash buffer that you're gonna dilute um, in water, um, and then you're gonna use that to wash the wells. And then you, we're also gonna use a microtiter plate. And, and this is the vessel that we're gonna be doing our experiment in. And um, each well serves as a separate mini test tube of sorts. Uh, when doing the experiment, uh, you know, each well is an individual reaction done in parallel with the other reactions. And so finally, we need to get the samples and reagents into the wells. To simplify today's demonstration, I am going to use um, these little transfer pipettes, um, but if you have adjustable volume pipettes, you can use them as well, but there is no special equipment necessary for this experiment. So let me move this here. Um, I'm gonna move this up. Uh, let me move this here. Um, I'm going to move this up. Um, get started, we're going to work through this protocol together, step by step. Um, and while the samples are incubating, I will kind of give you background. We'll talk about the ELISA and we'll discuss HIV. Uh, so um, I'm going to do the first three steps here, highlighted in red. The first thing to do, we do to prepare is to label all our reagents, our tubes, um, our pipettes. Um, do movie magic. I did that already. The last thing I'm sure you want to do is see me labeling pipettes, but using the appropriate uh, pipette, our transfer pipette, um, which we I am going to use, it's going to be labeled as AG or antigen. Um, so we're going to use this transfer pipette and we are going to use that to put our antigen sample AG um, into all of our wells. And so then we're gonna give this a few minutes to incubate before moving on to the next step. So what you're gonna see is that, oh, there is a lot of pipetting in this and the pipetting can take time. Uh, and as you can see, I got a little drop right here. Um, and that is a potential place where your students can have error. Um, you know, missing the well, getting it in the wrong well. Um, 
you know, um, cross-contamination. And it just it teaches your students why it's so important to be careful when pipetting. Um, and, you know, the, again, that, you know, there is always a little bit of human error in science. And, you know, this is one of the reasons why we do this experiment in triplicate, um, because there is always a little bit of human error experiment in triplicate. Um, because if one well is wrong, you know, that would tell us something about the experiment that would tell us that there was a problem. Um, okay, so I'm going to let this, right now we are in this, anti, this antigen incubation. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit more about the ELISA. Um, and we're going to talk about antibodies first, actually. The antibody is a very important part of the ELISA. Um, and so antibodies are molecules. They're also called immunoglobulins. These specialized proteins are made by our immune system to differentiate between self and non-self proteins or polysaccharides. We call these non-self these non-self molecules antibody generators or antigens. And that's why I have the tube labeled AG. And so um, the peptides, uh, each antibody is a Y-shaped molecule composed of four polypeptide chains, two heavy chains and two light chains. Uh, the polypeptides are linked together by disulfide bonds. Now, if we were to compare the amino acid sequence of two antibodies, the vast majority is the same. However, So if we were to compare together, um, hold on, I hear I'm back again. I'm lost again. Sorry about that. Um, let me know when I come back if you can see me, um, and I will continue. Um, let me start. Um, I'm just going to keep talking a little bit about antibodies. Okay, I hear I'm back. Um, so let's talk about antibodies. Um, these we. Um, our, polypep our antibodies are Y-shaped molecules um, composed of four polypeptide chains, two heavy chains, and two light chains that are linked with disulfide bonds. Now, if we were to compare the amino acid sequence of two antibodies, the vast majority is going to be the same. However, the amino acid sequence of the antigen binding site, which is that little pocket at the end of the Y. So if we're thinking of the antibody as my hand, it's going to be these little pieces at the end of the Y. They're variable, allowing each antibody to recognize a unique echo at the end of the Y within the antigen. Since the sequence can be so variable, antibodies can recognize a lot of different molecules. And so you can think about the antibody-antigen connection like puzzle pieces. There are a lot of different pieces that are similar, but when they lock together, they lock together when there's a match. And this marks the antigen, but when they lock together, they lock together when there's a match. And this marks the antigen, whether it's an invading bacteria or virus or a cancer cell for destruction by the immune system. Because of their specificity, antibodies can be used to detect the presence of specific biomolecules, peptides, proteins, antigens, or hormones in a complex sample. So antibodies are produced when animals like rabbits or mice or guinea pigs or humans um, uh, come into contact or are injected with an antigen. Since many different immune cells within the animal produce antibodies in response to the antigen, the serum initially will contain a mixture of antibodies that can bind. And so this mixture of antibodies is called a polyclonal. If we isolate and culture individual immune cells from these animals, we can create a monoclonal antibody that recognizes a single epitope. And so let's think of our antigen like a water bottle. The hand in this picture is holding the bottom corner of the water bottle. We can think of that as one antibody recognizing a single epitope. This would be equivalent to a monoclonal antibody. Now, if we were holding the cap of the water bottle at the same time we were holding the back of the water bottle, we'd be recognizing two sites on the water bottle, not just one. And this is like a polyclonal antibody. Now, one type of the antibody isn't necessarily better or worse than the other. Uh, both types can be used for a wide array of experiments from the ELISA to staining cells or doing a Western blot. The most important thing is when developing the assay to take time and care to select the best antibody for your application. To be used in the lab, antibodies have to have a specific, robust, and reproducible interaction with their antigen. Antibodies that have a high affinity for nonspecific antigens will have unwanted cross-reactions that can result in high backgrounds. In contrast, an antibody with a weak affinity may not be sensitive enough for antigen detection. These antibodies would test an antibody with a weak affinity produce results with a high false positive or high false negative rate. 
There are many protocols for the ELISA, but they all rely on using antibodies to detect the presence of antigens in experimental samples. And they follow the same basic principles. First, we're gonna add our sample where it sticks to the plastic walls of our microtiter plate. So again, here is our microtiter plate. Um, and this is where we're basically putting that primary, that first antigen down. And the antigen is gonna stick through the, to the plastic walls of our microtiter plate through hydrophobic and electrostatic interactions. After washing away any excess samples, the wells are blocked with a protein containing buffer to prevent nonspecific interactions. And this is important because proteins are also, anti antibodies are also proteins that can stick to the wells. Um, and so for the ELISA we're performing today, we simplified some things so that we don't need the blocking step. We then add primary antibody to each well. If the antigen is present, the antibody binds through the electrostatic, through electrostatic interactions. Antibody binds through the electrostatic, through electrostatic interactions. Excess antibodies washed from the wells. And so in the ELISA, our primary antibodies are going to be the antibodies present in patient samples. The secondary antibody, which recognizes the primary antibody, is then, and is then um, added into the wells. And so um, it's added to the wells where if the antibody antigen complex has formed in the well, um, it will remain in the wells after they've been washed. The secondary antibody is covalently linked to an enzyme that allows for detection of the antibody antigen complex. A clear colorless substrate solution is added to each well. In wells where secondary antibody is present, the enzyme turns a clear substrate to green. Most, and since most enzymes have a high catalytic activity, meaning they can quickly turn over the substrate, this assay allows us to quickly detect even the smallest amount of antibody. So we can think about our complex like an ice cream cone. Um, so we've built this complex in our tubes, and let's think about it like an ice cream cone. So the cone is our antigen, which binds to the microtiter plate. Each scoop of ice cream is an antibody in our complex. The first scoop is our primary antibody, and the second is our enzyme-linked antibody. And so we're building a complex on top of our, our antigen. Okay, so now we are going to add our control in our patient samples. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my pipettes that are labeled for each well, and I am going to remove the, or I'm going to actually take the antigen um, one, and I am going to remove the antibody for, or the antigen from each of these wells. Um, so let's just do this. So right now, everything in these wells are the same. So it's okay if I, that I'm using this antigen pipette in all of the same samples. Um, but, you know, we have to be careful moving forward. Um, that we don't use the same pipette in different wells because that is a place where we can potentially cross-contaminate. Um, so I've got all the sample out and we're going to do a quick wash two times. Um, basically, by to wash, we are going to take buffer um, and we are going to put the buffer in each of the wells and then we are going to remove it using a pipette. Um, we do that twice. That takes away everything that didn't bind. Um, and, and that's important because if we leave the stuff behind that doesn't bind to the plastic, um, you know, we will get a lot of background or we might get results that are not correct. And, you know, we want to, we aim to have precision and accuracy in our experiments. We aim to get the correct results. Again, you know, sometimes things go wrong. And again, that is part of science. Um, science can be messy, um, but, you know, we're trying our best to get good, clean, reproducible results right now. So again, I have my negative buffer. Removing the wash buffer from these three wells with the negative control that will add the negative control. Um, I'm going to move the pos take the positive, you know, take the antigens out. Uh, these are, well, this is our wash buffer. Um, at this time, so again, washing away any excess protein that is not bound. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat window. Um, you know, we are going to wash these wells twice. I might just wash them once in the interest of time um, so that we can move on um, because we do want to make sure we fit this all in. And, you know, given the technical challenges, um, you know, we're running a little behind, no big deal. Um, so I'm going to just do my wash one time. You would do this. Your students would do the wash twice, um, you know, but we'll see how it turns out. 
And so we're going to add three drops of our antigens to each of these wells, um, to our samples. So here is our negative control. Um, you know, so technically there should be no HIV antibodies in this sample. Let's get our positive control. Um, we're going to use the plus tube and the plus pipette. Um, this is a tube where we would expect there would be antibodies. The antibodies are going to bind to the antigens on our plate um, and, you know, start forming that complex. All right, take our P1 and our P1 sample. Um, you know, in a perfect world, you'll have a test tube rack um, and then use the test tube rack to, um, you know, hold all your little tubies. Um, I often use a little bit of Play-Doh as a, an at-home test tube rack. It works really well. Um, but, um, you know, so I used my P2 pipette for my P1. I noticed that. Um, so I am going to be careful. I'm going to take a new pipette for my P2. Um, again, you know, I'm talking. I'm trying to do the experiment at the same time. This is a place where error can happen. Um, and so, you know... Um, you know, just pointing that out that any, you know, something as simple as using the wrong pipette could potentially um, cause problems. I'm just going to label this one P2 just so I know what was used with that. Um, you know, but talking and not paying attention to what you're doing is a big place where um, error can be introduced. So we are in our sample incubation now. Um, so let's talk a little bit more, um, you know, while our complex is forming. So, um, in this step, we added our patient samples. Um, you know, the assay is going to look for specific antibodies in our samples that suggest a person what has been infected with HIV. So, what is HIV? Um, a few important de definitions. HIV, or the human Im immunodeficiency virus, is the, and let me actually bring my little model of HIV here. Um, this is our, our origami organelle HIV model. Um, can you guys see that? Okay, let me move this up a little bit, move the model in. Um, so HIV or the human immunodeficiency virus is the name of the virus responsible for the AIDS pandemic. It's a retrovirus that spreads through contact with blood, semen, or other bodily fluids. Initial infection by HIV may cause flu-like symptoms within two to four weeks of infection, but it's generally quite mild in the beginning. However, after some time, sometimes 10 years after the infection, HIV will progress to AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency disease um, syndrome. And so um, the progression uh, to AIDS is characterized by progressive deterioration of an individual's immune system. This allows infectious agents to invade the body and to propagate unchecked, you know, because your immune system is weakened and unable to fight back. And so a hallmark of AIDS is the development of rare diseases and cancers that the body cannot fight off. And it's usually these diseases that result in death. So let's talk about the virus itself. Um, here I brought the origami organelle. And these are great models that you can have your students use either at home if you're doing a hybrid schedule or if you're virtual um, or in the classroom as a, a pre-lab activity to really learn about the structure of the virus. And um, this is our full the full color version. My son, who is five, saw me making the model last night, um, and they actually are just black and white outlines. So he wanted to color one in, and so I told him I would show it um, in the workshop today uh, so that we could look at his beautiful HIV molecule as well. Um, and so these molecules, these are models of HIV. Um, the virus itself, is, viruses themselves are simple infectious particles that cannot replicate independently, so they are dependent on the cellular machinery within their specific host. And because viruses carry genetic material, reproduce and evolve, but rely entirely on a host organism for their basic biological functions, they are kind of considered to be on the border of biology and chemistry. Uh, HIV is a sneaky virus, and that's the virus we're talking about today. So once inside the body, you know, HIV can use specific enzymes um, that it brings with it, to integrate itself into the human genome where it is dormant until later activated. When the virus is active, it lowers the effectiveness of the human immune system, leaving the patient vulnerable to many opportunistic diseases. Specifically, HIV is a retrovirus, which is a family of viruses that uses specific, a special enzyme called reverse transcriptase, or RT, that uses RNA as a template to transcriptase, or RT, 
that uses RNA as a template to create a DNA molecule. The DNA is then integrated into the host genome where it hides out. And this means that even after the symptoms of the infection pass, the virus sticks around in the body. So retroviruses like HIV contain two copies of the single-stranded RNA genome. Um, so you can see we have our genome here on this little piece of paper in our model. In total, the HIV genome encodes for 19 proteins necessary for the virus's structure, integration, replication, and disruption of the host cell. The RNA is capped and polyadenylated just like a regular cellular messenger RNA. The genome is contained within a, a conical capsid uh, protein built from the protein capsid built from the p24 protein. The core also contains many molecules of reverse transcriptase. Again, that's the enzyme that takes the RNA genome and makes it into DNA, which can go in the genome. The capsid and the membrane protect the RNA genome from the outside environment. And then the envelope is studded with proteins that help the virus infect cells. And they interact with receptors on the surface of the cells in our immune system, like helper T cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. This lets them invade the cells where they take over the cell's machinery and reproduce. And so here is a cool image that I like, um, and it is an electron microscopy image, um, which allows us to visualize objects that are mere nanometers in width. And so in this picture, um, we can see um, the conical core, we can see the envelope and the membrane embedded, embedded proteins very clearly in this image. Um, and the, false, the colors are false, so someone false colored it after the fact. So the HIV life, life cycle. So after HIV gets into the bloodstream, it uses its surface proteins to bind with receptors on the immune cells. This allows the membrane of HIV to fuse with the membrane of the cell, releasing the protein core into the host cell. Once inserted into the host's genome, the viral DNA can actually lie dormant for long periods of time, which is known as the latent stage of infection. During active viral production, the DNA will be transcribed into mRNA, which then initiates production of viral proteins. The proteins in RNA assemble at the surface of the cell, forming a new virus particle. Finally, the completed virus buds off from the cell brain membrane, and it's ready to infect healthy T cells. So there are two main types. So there are types of HIV that cause disease in humans. The first and most common form is HIV-1, which is responsible for about 95% of all infections worldwide. HIV-2 is mostly found in West Africa and surrounding countries. It progresses more slowly than HIV-1, resulting in fewer fatalities. So to learn more about the virus, researchers sequence patient HIV genomes. Reverse transcriptase is a very error-prone enzyme meaning that when it's taking the RNA genome and turning it into DNA, it often creates mutations. So researchers have shown that HIV-1 has four major groups based on the genome sequence and several strains within each group. The major group, or M, is found in over 90% of people infected with, infected with HIV-1. The M strain is further separated into nine strains, which are further separated into substrains. And so there is much scientific discussion over whether these substrains are more or less infectious, whether the disease progresses more quickly in subs, but the Im important information is that, um, you know, the information allows researchers to follow the spread of the disease, the spread of specific strains, and to learn how the disease, the virus is evolving so researchers can get ahead of it. And also so clinicians can pre prescribe a course of treatment. So let's get back to our ELISA. Can we are going to remove the samples, again, using our pipettes, our, our correctly labeled pipettes. Let me get this out of the way. Um, so I am going to take my, we're going to remove the samples. So here is my minus pipette. Let's remove the minus. All right. And here's a plus. Again, we're not switching pipettes. I mean, we're not, we're um, changing pipettes to uh, make sure that we're not contaminating. Here's P1. I hear I'm frozen again, so I'm just gonna keep talking and going along. Hopefully I unfreeze soon. Um, there seems to be problems today um, with my internet connection. Um, it is a snow day here in Maryland, um, so everybody's at home, probably streaming on devices. Um, so I'm sorry if I freeze up. Um, okay, we are going to wash now. And so I'm going to take my three drops 
And again, I'm just going to wash once. If you were in the lab, you would definitely want to wash twice. Um, but in the interest of time, uh, and while I have a good connection, I am going to keep just moving on with the experiment. All right, so we're washing. Again, I'm going to use my minus pipette to want to um, remove again from each of these little wells my minus change to the plus to do the plus and so you can see with all this pipetting where there is potential for error <clears throat> and um you know what happens um no big deal um if anyone does anyone have any questions about what we're doing so far just put them in the chat window always happy to answer all right so we washed all of that patient sample out of the wells um, and now we are going to add our detection antibody which is our second antibody so remember this is like that top scoop on our ice cream cone um, that is going to bind here uh, if we if there is um, antibody in our patient samples Meaning I did the first half of the experiment, correct? <laughs> I mean, and we'll see. I'm doing this live with you guys. Um, you know, so we'll see how good I am at pipetting and talking. Some days it's better than others. But your teachers, I'm sure you understand um, what it is to talk and to teach at the same time and to try and do experiments. It's not always easy. Um, okay, so, and here is the protocol. Um, we are in those red steps now. Um, and so we are going to allow our enzyme-linked detection antibody to form a complex, and we're gonna allow this to incubate for a few minutes. So a timeline of HIV research and, and our knowledge of HIV. Um, so HIV is closely related to primate retroviruses. And let me bring model again, just so you can kind of look about it and think about it while, um, you know, while I'm talking. So you should be able to see that. That's the colored copy. Um, so um, HIV is believed to have made the jump from primates in the early, early 20th century in West Africa. And this was a time of urbanization and colonization in Africa, likely bringing humans in contact with infected animals. And scientists were able to actually reconstruct the early HIV genome from preserved human and primate samples. And looking back at historical records, there were people who died from immune system decline that couldn't be linked to any other disease. But worldwide infection from HIV largely began in the 1970s. Given that it can take years for HIV to progress to AIDS, the initial spread of the disease went largely unchecked. But in the late 70s and in the early 80s, researchers began to see widespread, um, widespread um, occurrences of the disease, of this immunosufficiency disease, especially in gay communities where there was a higher incidence of unprotected intercourse. And this did lead to a lot of prejudice, prejudice related to people with HIV AIDS, but we also know that at this time the disease did spread through heterosexual relationships, through blood banks, intravenous, drug use, and even in utero. And so we found ourselves in the midst of a pandemic, and that is an outbreak of disease in many different geographic regions affecting a substantial number of people. And given the trends we still see in infection rates, we remain in an HIV pandemic. While infection rates are declining, millions of people will be infected each year and hundreds of thousands of people will die, mostly from lack of treatment. In 1983 and 1984, several research groups identified that virus responsible for HIV and learned how it spread. They identified that casual contact, like hugging, shaking hands, or sharing dishes, um, could not spread the dot virus, and instead it could only be spread through contact with specific bodily fluids. They also learned outside the body, HIV lasts only for several hours. Research, researchers developed tests like the ELISA to identify the virus, which helped to slow the spread. And so by 1997, AIDS deaths began to decline because of uh, great testing initiatives, but also from treatment. And these medications um, largely consist of antiretroviral anti therapies that prevent the virus from reproducing in the body. And that means that it can't spread between individuals, but also that the virus cannot activate and cause immune system failure indicative of AIDS. And so with these therapies, today HIV has become a chronic condition and HIV patient, positive patients um, can live full lives without the occurrence of AIDS disease. And so luckily, 
um, with proper precautions, we can prevent the spread of HIV. The virus spreads from person to person through direct contact with certain bodily fluids. Um, and since we know the trans modes of transmission between people, we can take steps to protect ourselves from transmission by reducing our high-risk activities. For example, it's important to practice safer sex practices, including the correct use of condoms, to prevent fluid exchange. Needle exchange programs exist to provide new sterile syringes to drug users to help protect people in that way. Um, people who are pregnant can be given antiretroviral therapy that is going to reduce the transmission to the develop, uh, the developing fetus. Blood banks now screen blood, so people who need blood transfusions are no longer at risk for HIV. And, and these have all been shown to be effective mode methods to reduce transmission. If a person is engaged in high-risk activities, they can also take antiretroviral antiretroviral therapies in a protective context, either through pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is post-exposure prophylactic prophylaxis, which is PEP. And so these are antiviral therapies taken that can actually prevent HIV from establishing an infection. But, you know, the most important thing is communication. People must also be honest with their partners. Um, they must regularly test and talk about their health with people. Um, and these are also methods that a person can take responsibility for and to help prevent transmission. And so even while taking precautions, the most important thing is that if you are exhib exhibiting symptoms of HIV, please reach out to your doctor or your local public health officials. And so there's a lot of information on the internet um, about HIV and AIDS, some of which is intentionally misleading. So the best sources of information are going to come from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the World Health Organization. So there remains no cure or vaccine for HIV, though researchers are currently working on them. Um, but HIV positive people through ART can live. Hi, Nanny, please get out. Um, sorry, um, had a little bit of vis visitation from a kid. Um, uh, so um, he'll be happy to know that I showed his model off. Um, and so, um, you know, HIV positive people through um, ART can live long, healthy lives. With the right medications, the viral load actually in patient samples actually becomes undetectable, which clinicians mean believe that means an HIV positive person cannot spread the virus to their partners, though they do have that residual DNA um, in their genome. And so if you have symptoms and likely exposure, um, you will be tested for HIV. And even without exposure, you may be tested. For example, if you're pregnant and you didn't you weren't showing symptoms to prevent um, you know, um, infection of your the developing fetus. And so today there are several diagnostic assays that confirm HIV infection. Um, the nucleic acid test uses reverse transcription PCR to identify the presence of the viral genome in patient samples. Uh, this test is very sensitive and can detect infection within days uh, of the initial contact. Immunological tests like the ELISA have been developed to identify the presence of antibodies to HIV in patients and also to detect the presence of HIV proteins that are produced from viral replication. And finally, Western blotting also uses antibodies to detect the presence of a specific protein, but those proteins have been separated by SDS page and then transferred to a membrane. So most of the current um, ELISAs are what's called a fourth generation ELISA, and they are actually going to look for two different um, antibodies in patient samples. They're looking for IgM and IgB. The IgM antibody serves as the first line of defense against the HIV virus. These are very large antibodies that are able to bind to pathogens and label them for inactivation by the immune system. As the body adapts to create long-term immunity to the virus, IgG antibodies are produced in the plasma B cells. Them for inactivation by the immunities are produced in the plasma B cells. These antibodies are part of the adaptive immune system. And the presence of these high level of antibodies suggests a later stage of infection. And many fourth generation tests also use antibodies to detect the presence of P24, the capsid protein, which is produced pretty early on in infection, in HIV infection, and can be detected relatively soon after HIV infection. And so what we're looking at here is one of these fourth generation tests. Um, and you can see um, the difference between a positive and a negative test. So in the non-reactive or negative test, we see our control shows up um, as a pink line, but we do not see lines in either of the other sections. In the person who is positive, we do see um, a positive signal near the AG test line, 
which is looking for that P24 antigen, that viral capsid protein. And then we can see the AB test line, which is the presence of the, the HIV antibodies. And so, um, you know, now we are at the point where we are going to add our substrate to our reaction. So let me move my little virus model out of the way again. Um, so again, I am going to take my pipettes. I take my. Um, I am going to remove my detection antibody from all of the wells using the correct pipette. One just fell down on my foot. Where did it go? Oh, that was my secondary antibody one anyway, so I don't need that one. Let me get my positive pipette, positive, 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 remove it. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box right now. Um, you know, I'm happy to answer them while I'm pipetting. Um, it gives me something to talk about. Um, but again, you know, I, I, there's always the possibility of pipetting error, which I am trying very hard to, um, you know, not do. And so again, this is removing that detection antibody. This is that enzyme-linked antibody. So um, what we'd imagine is, I'm gonna, so now I've removed this detection antibody from all of my samples. Um, we're gonna wash. In the lab, you would wash twice. I'm washing once in the interest of time. Um, just, you know, um, the, the more you wash, the cleaner your results will be because you're getting rid of any of the excess complex. Um, But, you know, in the interest of time and um, talking, it's easier for me to just do this. All right, so I'm going to then take my negative, again, trying to prevent cross contamination. Um, I'm going to remove the antibody, the, um, the wash buffer from all of those wells. Um, here we go again. And again, this is just removing anything that hasn't bound into that complex. Um, you know, uh, we, we started with the antigens. The antigens were first there. Um, those antigens were placed on the plate because they capture the antibodies in the patient samples. Um, if there are no antibodies in the patient samples, we can't form that complex. Um, so our detection antibody won't bind. And so this wash gets rid of all of that detection antibody because if we just added the detection antibody um, and we had a lot of it and we didn't wash it away, um, then we would have a problem um, because in that case, we would start to see the color develop um, in wells where we didn't form the complex just by virtue of having the enzyme-linked antibody there. Okay. And so I am going to add my substrate now at this point. Um, and so remember, our substrate is going to, um, is going to interact with the enzyme that is linked to our detection antibody. And that's important um, because we should be able to see um, the colors change pretty, um, oh, I got a fuzz on there. Um, we should be able to see our positive and our negative controls react appropriately. Um, so, so far negative, um, we see no color change in our negative samples. Um, hopefully we will start to see some positive changes. Oh, that's the secondary antibody one. I don't wanna do that. I wanna get my ABTS. There's a potential that I just added secondary antibody to all of these wells because I don't see color change. So I am just going to remove, um, again, experimental error happens to the best of us. I am going to use this transfer pipette to just remove the sample again. I'm gonna do a quick wash of those two wells because I'm Pretty sure I added the wrong thing. Um, this is not a recommended protocol, but you know, again, we are just rolling with it. Um, you know, your students will be more careful. I might get a C on this lab report, but an A for effort. <laughs> um, but you know, we, we all understand how it's difficult to science and talk sometimes. And I just knocked everything over, but that's okay. All right, so now I'm adding my ABTS. And this should be the ABTS. You know what, let me get a new transfer, claim the transfer pipette, because if I did have secondary antibody in there, it would make it turn green. 
All right, so let's get that in there. And I didn't give myself enough. I'm trying to overfill these wells to really get good color change. And I ran out. So luckily I have my big tube of ABTS that I prepped here. Oh my goodness, and you can see I definitely used a um, because those wells, my positive and my negative control are turning green. Um, that's okay. Science happens, mistakes happen, um, you know, and basically at this point, um, you know, we would make sure to discuss that in the lab report that Danielle, was talking the entire time and perhaps used the wrong pipette. So where could I have made this mistake? Um, you know, um, I think I identified it because I used my detection antibody um, in the wrong in the wrong order after I had done the wash. Um, and I think I just introduced too much to the wells and didn't wash them out well enough. Um, and because you can see, I get that green color in my top two wells. Um, where I just made that little mistake, but my bottom wells look pretty good. My P1 looks pretty clear. My P2 looks green. And so um, if we look at the results and conclusion picture, um, that is what it should look like. Um, and so in this simulated medical test, we used the ELISA to detect the presence of anti-HIV body antibodies in a patient's blood sample. And we can see our positive and negative controls um, ideally would change color appropriately. In this case, um, I did make a mistake and use, I believe I used the wrong pipette and introduced um, the wrong sample into those wells. And so that's why we're getting the, I use wells. And so that's why we're getting the, I, I added extra detection antibody. And that's why you can see how they're getting very dark and very green um, quickly. Um, but I think it does show um, what good color change you get with the experiment. Um, in in the image on the screen that we did in the lab, you can see the positive and negative controls change color appropriately. The positive control is green and the negative control is clear. In patients that have been infected with the virus, the ELISA detects those IgG and IgM antibodies and a color change is seen. In contrast, a patient who is not infected with HIV will not have the antibodies and there will be no color change. So looking at our plate, we actually can see that. So ignore my controls for now. Um, we can see that patient two has HIV antibodies in their blood um, and patient one does not. And so basically um, a test like this would be considered indeterminate because our controls did not work um, and you would likely repeat the assay. So we have come to the end of our experiment. Um, thank you for sticking with me. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick recap. Now is the point if you have any questions to please put them in the chat window. Um, and I will answer them. So um, we've covered a lot of information over the course of this experiment. We talked about HIV, which is the retrovirus that is responsible for the AIDS pandemic. And so while additional in, initial symptoms of HIV are flu-like, progression of the disease is gonna weaken the immune system, leaving patients susceptible to infection. And the spread of HIV remains a major health, public health concern worldwide, especially in areas of the world where treatment is unavailable. There, the disease can spread unchecked, especially within vulnerable communities. And detection relies on patient screening using medical tests. So in this workshop, we simulated an HIV ELISA, which defects, identifies HIV antibodies and antigens in patient samples. The ELISA has evolved into a powerful and versatile biotechnology technique that can be applied to many diagnostic scenarios. And using these tests, which can even be done at home, we can detect, detect HIV earlier and thus be able to treat the disease quickly as well as prevent its spread. And so I know teaching this can be a little scary, a little uncomfortable, especially because there are controversial and uncomfortable aspects to teaching about HIV, given the nature of its transmission. But that makes this the perfect vehicle to teach your students about virology, epidemiology, and medical testing, medical testing in the context of current events. Your students are already likely curious to learn more. And then it'll also help combat misinformation that can spread like wildfire and help your students become advocates for their own personal health. For the most up-to-date information and for more resources, be sure to visit the CDC website. 
And so we will be posting the presentation and the slides in the next few days to our website, which is www.edvertech.com. If you'd like to us to email you when they are available, please fill out the form that Maria put in the, in the um, chat window, and we'll contact you in a few days with the slides. So um, if there are no questions, um, you know, I, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, if you have anything, please put it in the chat now. Um, don't forget about our contest, edvotech.com contest. We are giving away that Edvo Cycler Jr. and we would love for you to win one. Um, and, you know, I just want to say thank you for your time. If you need us, um, there are lots of ways. Oh, I didn't go to my last slide, which has all the information um, on how to get in touch with us. Um, you can get in touch with us at info at edvotech.com or one of our social media channels. Um, you know, be sure to follow us on subscribe on YouTube. Um, you'll get alerts when any, we have any new videos come up. Um, and, you know, we're just grateful for you spending time with us as we talk about this experiment. Thank you for bearing with me as I made my little goof. Um, you can, but um, I think what you'll see is this is a fun and an easy experiment for your students to do. Um, and it really allows you to teach a lot of different things. And so thank you for your time. And we'll be doing another live stream soon. So again, be sure to like this video, be sure to subscribe, and we will see you again soon um, for our next live stream. Have a fantastic afternoon. Stay safe, stay warm if you're somewhere cold, um, and we'll see you again soon. Have a good one. Bye.